Everybody, welcome, welcome to the first talk in our Jean Monnet Center Montreal Winter 21 Speaker Series. Before, before I begin and introduce our speaker, I just wanna let everybody know that the talk itself, but not the Q&A will be recorded um, and will be available on our website later. So if you don't, if you don't, want, uh, if you don't want to be recorded, don't interrupt our speaker. <laughs> but we won't, uh, we won't have that as an option anyway. Anyway, I'm so glad to see such a wonderful large audience today. Uh, I'm Juliet Johnson. I'm professor of political science at McGill University and a member of the center. I'll be moderating our speaker series this term. And as you know, the theme this term is Europe and memory. And we have a fantastic lineup of speakers coming to you every Thursday. So what we're gonna do is we'll start with our speaker's presentation. It'll be around 40 minutes or so. This will be followed by a short presentation by today's discussant, Lily Martin, who's a student in our graduate class in European memory politics at McGill this semester, and then we'll open it up to questions. And when we get to the part uh, where we open it up to questions, please use the raise hand function um, in, the, in the reactions box below to indicate that you wanna ask a question. And I'll be moderating that Q&A as well. And we'll be ending promptly at 10.25 a.m. All right, so without further ado, I am so excited to have as our first speaker today, Elena Subotic, who's a professor in the Department of Political Science at Georgia State University. She writes broadly about international relations theory, memory politics, human rights, transitional justice, ethics, identity, the politics of the Western Balkans. She's truly amazing. Uh, her first book, Hijack Justice, Dealing with the Past in the Balkans examined how international norms of transitional justice were appropriated by domestic political elites in the Western Balkans in the aftermath of the Yugoslav Wars. But her more recent and multiple award-winning book, which she'll discuss today, is Yellow Star, Red Star, Holocaust Remembrance After Communism. So, Yelena, let me turn it over to you, and we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much, and I'm so grateful to see how many people actually joined. Uh, all I would say that I would much, much prefer to be in Montreal, January or not, uh, than in my room slash office, uh, but here we are. So hopefully next time we do this, uh, it will be in person. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna uh, share my screen uh, because as I go, I have, um, quite a few slides and pictures to show. Mm -hmm. So let me know if this works. Is this showing for people? Excellent, yeah. okay. Yes, looks good. All right. So in 2014, I visited my hometown of Belgrade, Serbia, and I went to see an exhibition at the Serbian Historical Museum, which was called In the Name of the People, Political Repression in Serbia After World War II. And the exhibition promised to display new historical documents and evidence of various crimes, such as assassinations, kidnappings, detentions in camps, of the Yugoslav communist regime after 1945. But as I walked through the exhibit, I stopped in my tracks. I recognized a photograph. In the Belgrade exhibition, this image was displayed in the section devoted to the communist era camp for political prisoners on the Adriatic island of Goli Otok in today's Croatia. The exhibition describes the photograph as, quote, the example of, the example of living conditions of Goli Otok prisoners, end quote. But I knew, and you probably know, that the photograph was not it. In front of me was a well-known photograph of prisoners from the Nazi Buchenwald concentration camp, including Elie Wiesel. The picture taken at Buchenwald liberation in April, 1945. It is one of the most well-known photographs of the Holocaust. So I went home, called a couple of historian friends who assured me that complaints had already been lodged with the museum and that a display was about to be corrected. Sometime thereafter, in response to an outcry from Holocaust historians, 
a small note was taped underneath the display that they read a photograph of prisoner boxed beds in Dachau camp. Now that nobody bothered to check that a photograph was in fact from Buchenwald and not from Dachau is symptomatic of the broad irrelevance with which the Holocaust is met in Serbia. But what I took from this exhibition was not only the indifference and carelessness when dealing with the Holocaust, but more fundamentally, the attempt to equate communism and fascism, and in doing so, appropriate Holocaust remembrance and imagery to delegitimize communism. But this is hardly an indigenous Serbian invention. In Hungary, here's the House of Terror, which goes out of its way to bring home the message that fascism and communism were flip sides of the same coin, there are multiple visual representations of black totalitarianism and red totalitarianism, of the black arrow cross and the red star, of the fascist uniform and the communist uniform. But in addition to equating fascism and communism and doing so with blunt force, many of these museums and memorials have also begun depicting their entire nation states as victims of foreign regimes thus completely ignoring both the actual lived experience of various victims of these regimes, but also, and more importantly for my purposes here, completely erasing any discussion of local complicity for any historical crimes, be they crimes of the Holocaust or crimes of the Gulag. For example, the House of Terror Museum in Budapest narrates the story of Hungary's 20th century experience as a nation victim of the foreign communist regime. In this museum's exposition, the fascist era begins with the German occupation in 1944 and not in 1940 when Hungary joined the Axis Alliance. This shift therefore completely removes the history of the Holocaust in Hungary before 1944, the period that left 60,000 Hungarian Jews killed as early as 1942, the extermination carried out not by Germans, but by Hungarian forces under the rule of Regent Miklos Horthy. Similarly, the memorial to the victims of the German occupation erected in 2014 in Budapest, memorializes Hungary, the country, as the main victim of the German occupation by a not very subtle depiction of Germany's imperial ego crushing of Hungary, which is symbolized by Arch Archangel Jacob Gabriel. But also note the deep domestic contestation this memorial has produced. At the bottom of the picture, you can see handwritten notes and pictures left by Holocaust survivors or their family members that want to tell the story of 430,000 Jews who were deported from Hungary, mostly to Auschwitz. The quickest rate of deportation in the history of the Holocaust, taking less than two months and done with the active participation of Hungarian civil servants. And in Vilnius, Lithuania, the top tourist destination is the Museum of Victims of Genocide, but in a country that was ground zero for the Holocaust, where 95% of pre-war Jewish population was exterminated, the highest number of any occupied country anywhere in Europe this is not the museum to those victims to that genocide. It is a museum to the victims of the Soviet occupation that in Lithuania is considered the real genocide. And yet, this remembrance of the 20th century is not exactly Holocaust denial. Viktor Orban even declared 2014 a year of Holocaust commemoration. However problematic, it does not prominently feature voices that deny the Holocaust as a historical fact, nor challenge its most established realities. It is also not quite the same as trivialization. While the emphasis always is on the larger ethnic groups, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Lithuanians suffering, it is relatively rare to hear outright belittling of Jewish victimization. A more nuanced way of understanding this type of Holocaust remembrance I suggest in the book is this memory appropriation. 
where the memory of the Holocaust is used to memorialize a different kind of suffering, such as suffering under communism or suffering from ethnic violence perpetrated by other groups. It is Holocaust remembrance turned inward and away from the actual victims of the Holocaust or the Holocaust itself into what Polish theorist Iwa Plonowska Zjarek calls the narcissistic identification with Jewish suffering. But why does all this matter? After all, Holocaust revisionism is not new and is not particularly surprising. And certainly there has been much revisionism in the West. But here is what I respond. My principal argument is that post-communist states today are dealing with conflicting sources of insecurity. They are anxious to be perceived as fully European by core Western European states, a status that remains fleeting. Being fully European, however, means sharing in the cosmopolitan European narratives of the 20th century, perhaps the strongest being the narrative of the Holocaust. But this was not always the case. What we today refer to as the Holocaust did not exist as a concept or as a marker in global collective memory prior to the early 1960s. Holocaust memory has developed over time and has gone through various phases in various countries and over various periods. In the West, what we today would recognize as the narrative of the Holocaust emerged with a series of important trials in the 1960s of Adolf Eichhorn in Jerusalem and the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt, as well as a series of popular cultural events, such as the American TV show, The Holocaust in the late 1970s, and especially the Schindler's List in 1993, which placed Jewish suffering at the center of the Holocaust narrative and presented a visual and symbolic repertoire of how we think the Holocaust looked like, which remained mostly stable until today. But the Soviet dominated East placed events of World War II within a larger narrative of communist revolutionary triumph and anti-fascist heroism. Communist memory was hegemonic memory, not open to alternative or particular claims on suffering, such as the suffering of the Jews. In communist Eastern Europe, Holocaust remembrance was exclusively produced through the framework of anti-fascism because this link established the communist regime with its new post-war identity and provided it with ongoing political legitimacy. So the two ways of remembering East and West diverged almost immediately after the war and developed in quite different directions throughout the post-war period. And it is at the point of contact after the end of communism in 1991 that these two ways of remembering began to cross paths. Almost immediately, the European narrative of the Holocaust created stress and resentment in post-communist states, which have been asked to accept and contribute to this primarily Western European account as members or candidate states of the European Union and NATO. The problem is that the cosmopolitan Holocaust memory as developed in the West did not narratively fit with a very different set of Holocaust memories in post-communist Europe. This lack of fit was evident primarily in the lack of centrality of the Shah as the defining memory of the 20th century experience across the post-communist space. As Tony Judd put it, the really uncomfortable truth about World War II was that what happened to the Jews between 1939 and 1945 was not nearly as important to most of the protagonists as later sensibilities might wish. Instead of the memory of the Holocaust, Eastern European states after communism constructed their national identities on the memory of Stalinism and Soviet occupation, as well as pre-communist ethnic conflict with other states. The European centrality of the Holocaust then replaced the centrality of communist and ethnic victimization as the dominant organizing narrative of post-communist states and was therefore threatening and destabilizing to these state identities. And so in the book, I document how influencing European Union's own memory politics and legislation in the process 
post-communist states have attempted to resolve these insecurities by putting forward a new kind of Holocaust remembrance, where the memories, symbols, and imagery of the Holocaust become appropriated to represent crimes of communism instead. The criminal past is not fully denied, but the responsibility for it is misdirected. And this accomplishes two things. It absolves the nation from acknowledging responsibility for its criminal past, while at the same time, it makes communism as a political project criminal. But I wanna make two additional important points. The centrality of the Holocaust as a foundational European narrative is also soundly rejected across post-communist Europe because of its perceived elevation of Jewish victimhood above victimhood of other regional majority ethnic groups, a move that is increasingly openly resented. In the absence of almost any Jews across vast swaths of the East, post-communist national identities were built first on a rejection of the communist pan-national identity project, where the organizing narrative is loyalty to the socialist and not the ethnic subject, and instead on ethnic majoritarian and therefore very homogeneous basis that leaves almost no room for incorporation of minority narratives. Holocaust remembrance therefore challenges the security of a nation's identity because it problematizes the very biography on which this identity was constructed. Further, the European Holocaust memory's focus on Jewish suffering is also rejected in much of post-communist Europe because it brings about discussion about extensive and deep local complicity in the Holocaust and material and political benefits of the complete Jewish absence across Eastern Europe. Jewish businesses, homes, and property have over decades of looting followed by communist seizures slowly morphed into the general economy with difficult and sporadic attempts at restitution. And the fact that post-World War II Jewish communities in these countries are negligible in numbers and have limited political clout is not incidental to this narrative. Once multicultural societies with large Jewish minorities are now mostly ethnically homogeneous. And this very fact of post-war ethnic homogeneity is a problem anthropologist Michael Hertzfeld called cultural intimacy, an issue of domestic identity building, the thing that builds the nation together, but simultaneously an issue of international embarrassment and sometimes even shame. And this is why much of Eastern Europe is a purposeful site of non-memory, a site of dismembered multi-ethnicity, a landscape of erasure. So next I want to demonstrate that a way out of this condition of ontological insecurity or insecurity about its own identity for post-communist states was to connect the undesirable remembrance of the Holocaust with a desirable remembrance of communism and its crimes. The consequence of this move was a new inverted memory of the Holocaust where the crimes of fascism came to be represented as crimes of communism. Now, post-communist European states first encountered the European push for a unified cosmopolitan memory of the Holocaust as they tried to join various European organizations after 1991, foremost in their applications for EU membership, but also membership in other European institutions, such as, for example, the Council of Europe. A major European institutional push, however, was the Stockholm Forum on the Holocaust in January 2000, convened by Sweden to define a common framework for European Holocaust remembrance, research, and education. The forum established the International Task Force on Holocaust Education, Remembrance, and Research, since renamed the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, which remains the most explicit international organization that constructs, institutionalizes, and diffuses transnational Holocaust memory in Europe. In 2005, the European Parliament adopted its most complete resolution of the Holocaust, which established the 27th of January, the day of liberation of Auschwitz in 45 by the Soviet Red Army, as the European Holocaust Memorial Day across the whole of the EU. And while post-communist states 
accepted this new regulation, they signed documents and adopted major parameters of the memory framework, not wanting to jeopardize the delicate process of EU accession. Once they were safely in the EU, the new Europeans demanded a thorough renegotiation of European memory politics, one that denies the Holocaust its centrality for post-war European memory, and instead places it on par with the other major totalitarianism of the 20th century, communism. Significantly, East European states forged alliances with the Western European right, most directly the European People's Party in the European Parliament, in pushing for EU resolutions and proclamations that would decentralize the Holocaust from pan-European memory and add crimes of Stalinism as its equal. The push to commemorate side by side the two 20th century totalitarianisms culminated in two European Union documents. The 2008 Declaration on the Proclamation of the 23rd of August as the European Day of Remembrance for victims of Stalinism and Nazism, and the resolution on European conscience and totalitarianism, which built on the 2008 Prague Declaration of the same name. Now the Prague Declaration is perhaps the most explicit document that lays out the ideological framework post-communist European states have used regarding the place of the Holocaust and communist memory. And while the declaration's first article states that, quote, both the Nazi and the communist totalitarian regimes should each be judged by their own terrible merits, end quote, the declaration then goes on to make this claim, quote, exterminating and deporting whole nations and groups of population were indivisible parts of the ideologies they availed themselves with, end quote which explicitly equated the specifically genocidal aspect of Nazism, extermination of whole nations, and attributed it to communism. Now, the rhetorical move of referring to communist crimes instead of Stalinist crimes is critical here, as it implies that terror was communism's central organizing feature, which then makes it easily narratively equated with fascism. Indeed, this equation of the two regimes as being structurally the same even led one European member of parliament to declare, quote, I ask the European parliament to stand in solidarity with the victims of fascist communism, end quote. And please also note that the official banner of the Prague Declaration movement wants to prohibit the hammer and the sickle, not the swastika. Now I want to further illustrate these arguments with some examples of contemporary Holocaust remembrance practices in Croatia, the newest EU member, and point to specific ways in which state power was used to discipline and organize political memory. Croatia's memory of the Holocaust is a source of severe state anxiety. Croatia's relationship with the Holocaust is deep, broad, and incredibly contentious. During World War II, Croatia declared an independent state, a Nazi puppet statelet governed by the homegrown fascist government, the Ustasha. The Ustasha implemented fascist racial laws in large part autonomously and sometimes even more brutally than the German Reich. Anti-Jewish laws, Aryanization of Jewish property, followed by the deportation and extermination of Croatia's Jews were carried out with great speed and efficiency, earning much praise from Berlin. Significantly, however, the Ustasha were not interested only in the annihilation of Croatian Jews. The central part of their project was also the full-scale destruction of Croatia's large Serb and smaller Roma minorities. Across a vast network of Croatian concentration and extermination camps, the largest of which was Jasenovac, which I'll talk more about in a minute, as well as to summary executions across the country and deportations to other Nazi camps, some 32,000 or 80% of Croatian Jews, some 300,000 or 17% of Croatian Serbs, and almost all Croatian Roma, some 25,000, were killed between 1941 and 1945. This unusable past 
present a serious problem for the new Croatia, which emerged an independent state out of the rubble of the former Yugoslavia in 1991. In constructing its post-Yugoslav identity, the new Croatia needed to sidestep the communist past as a legitimate period of the country's history and institute a clear historical connection with a pre-communist state as an inspirational model for contemporary manifestation of ethnic statehood, thus stabilizing Croatia's state identity through time. The problem, however, was that the only modern independent Croatia the new state could go back to and root its new statehood in was the World War II fascist Croatian state and all the memory baggage it brought with it. And so as part of this memory replacement, Croatia embarked on a hurricane of World War II monument destruction in an attempt to visually erase any connection Croatia had with the 50 years of communism and 50 years of Yugoslavia. Almost all communist era monuments to World War II, including the few monuments that mention specifically Jewish victims, were fully removed or partially destroyed, vandalized, or desecrated. Often victims groups would put up a replica of the monument only to see it disappear again, often within 24 hours. Some monuments were simply replaced in place of a monument to anti-fascist struggle, a new monument to Croatia's war of independence between 1991 and 1995 would spring up. Out of 6,000 monuments memorializing World War II in Croatia, almost 3,000 monuments, including more than 700 monuments of exquisite artistic or cultural value were blown up with explosives, destroyed fully or in part, in the post-independence decade between 1991 and 2000. Not only was no one prosecuted for the destruction of cultural property, but in many locations, it was the local chapter of the Croatian ruling political party, the Croatian Democratic Union, that organized the removal of the monuments. From the narrative perspective of the new Croatian state, the monuments to World War II had to be destroyed because they represented a symbol of a different future, a vision of an international and domestic order Croatia no longer wanted and found threatening to its new national identity. And while the public memory of the Holocaust and genocide committed in the independent state of Croatia was completely absent from the constitutive identity of the new state, a new public memory emerged that has since overtaken all other remembrance of World War II and began to be referred to as the Croatian Holocaust. This was the constructive memory of the massacre of Croatian soldiers, most of them retreating Ustasha, who refused to surrender at the end of the war, but also many members of their families who had been killed by the Yugoslav communist partisans at the end of the war in May, 1945, on the territories of what is today Austria and Slovenia. The events of May 1945, which are called Bleiburg in Croatia because the commemorations occur annually at Bleiburg, Austria, even though the actual killing took place in different locations. Since 1991, for the purposes of Croatia's new state identity build, building, began to be seen and commemorated as a communist assault on the entire Croatian nation. From the realm of unofficial diaspora commemorations, the Bleiburg ceremonies in post-Yugoslav Croatia became fully state sanctioned. And the Croatian government designated the day of Bleiburg commemoration every May as a day of memory of Croatian victims in the struggle for freedom and independence everywhere. Now this right here was the state power to redirect political memory. But this new remembrance was not a remembrance of just a massacre. It became a memory of the Holocaust but with Croats as victims and not as perpetrators. An early explicit use of the term the Holocaust for Bleiburg occurred at a 50th anniversary of the events in 1995, when the Speaker of the Croatian Parliament addressed the assembly and called Bleiburg the Holocaust of Croatian martyrs. The appropriation of the Holocaust for Bleiburg specifically, and then for the larger Croatian historical suffering has since become ubiquitous. 
The claim that Bleiberg was the Holocaust of Croatian Catholics has fully entered the Croatian public narrative and goes mostly unchallenged in the public sphere. The commemorations at Bleiburg, however, did not occur in an international vacuum. In fact, much of Croatia's contemporary memorialization follows the narrative framework offered in the 2008 EU Prague Declaration that I already talked about. The declaration statement on two totalitarianisms is referred to whenever a discussion arises about proper remembrance of Croatia's fascist legacies. At the 2011 Bleiburg commemoration, Andrea Hebrang, then member of the Croatian parliament said, quote, Bleiburg is the biggest symbol of Croatian suffering that equates fascism and communism. Communism becomes worse than fascism. It becomes the world's biggest evil because it turns into the system of killing everyone who thought differently, end quote. And it is also not incidental that commemorations at Bleiburg have since become full-fledged neo-Nazi and neo-fascist gatherings, where old black uniforms and black flags of the World War II fascist Croatian militia are proudly displayed to increasing discomfort of Austria on which territory this event takes place and which has its own Holocaust issues. But it is Jasenovac, the central location of the Holocaust in Croatia, the site where 85,000 Serbs, Jews, and Roma were killed in unspeakably gruesome ways, that continues to be the most significant and contested site of Holocaust remembrance in Croatia. There are almost no historical photographs of Jasenovac, as the Ustasha by the end of the war blew it up and destroyed all records as the communist partisans were advancing. This photograph of a Jewish man forced to remove his ring right before being shot is a rare surviving photograph. Today, there are no physical remains of the camp. Instead, there is this towering and beautiful flower memorial built in the 1960s during communist Yugoslavia. However, a new narrative has emerged in the past few years that claims that the story of Jasenovac was overblown and that its high death toll was fabricated by Yugoslav communist and later Serbian nationalist propaganda. This narrative has then further morphed into the claim that Jasenovac was in fact not a fascist camp at all, but it was run by communists as a place of mass execution of Croatian patriots after the end of World War II. This narrative is promoted by established as well as revisionist historians including a brand new research institute, which purpose is to determine the truth about this communist camp. A high profile recent revisionist push was the film, Jasenovac, The Truth, which received uh, the official award by the city of Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. The film purports to show evidence that Jasenovac was in fact run by communists. The evidence for these claims is almost comical in its amateurish forgery. There are fake newspaper, newspaper headlines, images of bodies turning up on the banks of the river, which is located upstream from the camp, photographs of apparently happy and content Serbian Jewish inmates, as if to show that nothing bad happened there during the war, which turned out to be photographs of a football team from 1978, and so on and so on. But no matter, this revisionism has become so mainstream and state-sponsored that in 2018, then Croatian president called for the creation of an international commission to determine the truth about the camp between 1941 and 1945, but also after, she said, indicating that the narrative that Jasenovac was a communist camp after the war was now accepted at the top seat of power. Similarly, in the attempt to erase fascist crimes and use their imagery to represent real or imagined crimes of communism, at the site of the Staragradishka camp, which was part of the Yasinovac complex of camps, and I should add my father was interred as a child when he was 11, the Croatian government mounted a memorial plaque in 2011, memorializing political prisoners, victims of the communist regime, who perished in the Stara Gradiška prison on the occasion of August 23rd, their commemoration of victims of totalitarian and authoritarian regimes, 
And note the direct use of the EU resolution establishing August 23rd as a day of commemoration of victims of two totalitarianisms. The use of the word prison and not camp is important because it redirects remembrance to the pre-war and post-war period when the site was indeed used as a regular criminal prison, but not to World War II era Ustasha death camp where more than 12,000 Serbs, Jews, Roma, and other enemies of the independent state of Croatia, including a very high number of women and children, were killed. Out of three memorial plaques placed at the site of Stara Gradiška, not a single one indicates that it was the major concentration camp during World War II. 200 meters away, however, there is an old monument to victims of fascism between 90, uh, 1941 and 1945 that has since crumbled and is in ruins, nobody bothering to repair it. But all of this revisionism has happened not in spite, but as a result of EU's own practices of remembrance, especially its reductionist interpretation of the 20th century as an era of two totalitarianisms, equal in their criminal nature. EU's youngest member, Croatia, was nothing but a quick study. Excuse me. So let me conclude. Why the Holocaust? Why now? The memory of the Holocaust has been debated and revisited and debated again. And so why does all this still matter? My principal point that I want to leave you with is that while the historical and moral importance of Holocaust remembrance should be self-evident, Holocaust remembrance is also important for global politics. As my book documents the move toward Holocaust appropriation across post-communist Europe indicates that there is a lot going on under the European Union cloak. As the alarming turns to, turns to liberalism in Poland and Hungary and elsewhere show, joining the EU was not the end of history its architects imagined. And the fact EU accession has allowed these states to embark on radical projects of historical inversion, such as this cartoon in the right-wing Polish magazine that depicts the alleged collaboration of Jews and Nazis against the Poles in the Holocaust. All of these projects obviously doing tremendous violence to the historical record of World War II for very contemporary political purposes. And so the question that motivated this research is simply, how do we get here? What explains the need of so many post-communist East European states to revisit the Holocaust now, 75 years later, and control the way in which the Holocaust is remembered, understood, and interpreted? And the argument that I made today is that these developments could best be understood as actions of profoundly ontologically insecure states. While scholars have analyzed domestic political machinations of various political structures, right-wing and or populist parties in particular, and ways in which they have instrumentalized Holocaust remembrance to make very specific domestic political gains, such as expanding the voter base, delegitimizing liberal opponents, mobilizing nationalism, and so on, I have taken a broader view. I explored how states use their power, especially their mnemonic power, power over political memory, when their sense of self, their identity, was threatened by external political narratives that undermined the very basis of that identity. And as I have briefly shown, as they pursued their post-communist new European identities, these states encountered a solidified and codified political memory of the Holocaust, memory which did not fit with their own understanding of World War II. The desire to become European, to finally rejoin the West, then produced a particular type of Holocaust remembrance, which nominally followed the Western canon. Memorial days were instituted, museums were opened, memorials were built, textbooks were adapted, but in doing so, the existing narrative and visual imagery of the Holocaust was used to fight the real mnemonic battle of delegitimizing and criminalizing communism. 
So I hope to demonstrate ways in which post-communist states constructed a narrative about the past that bolsters their identity and self-esteem in the present. Practices of Holocaust remembrance I described are important for contemporary politics because they indicate that the basis of nation building after communism was ethnic and exclusionary. While this new identity construction may not be about the Jews or about the Holocaust at all, it comes from the place of exclusion of others, the non-existing Jews, but also the existent new others, refugees, migrants, or other ethnic minorities, such as the Roma or Muslims. But most significantly and most globally, the great delegitimation of communism that has swept Europe since 1991 is also produced a de-delegitimation of fascism, which is repackaged, retold, and reinterpreted to look more palatable and polite in the 21st century. And as I speak from the United States, I, I find a lot of irony in what I wrote a couple of years ago. The great tragedy of, the, of this anti-communist moment is that it has weakened and made less imperative our collective anti-fascist moment and we're living the consequences. The Shoah, therefore, is not only East European past, it also continues to be its present. And with that, I thank you very much, and I really look forward to the discussion comments and the Q&A. Thank you.